Now, I'm going today to talk about cosmos and creation. I should explain that I am actually a cosmologist professionally, but I'm very interested in, in the issues of philosophy and theology, which is why this meeting is, is so fascinating to me. I've just started off with this famous picture of, of God, uh, of course, touching Adam. And I don't know if, um, you probably realize this, but you notice God is in, in, in the brain, in the, that that is the shape of a brain. And, of course, Leonardo was aware of the structure of the brain, but it's something which people don't always realize. One of the issues I'm interested in is, what is the nature of consciousness, and, and is it, in fact, just generated by the brain, or is it something deeper? But anyway, what is uh, interesting about cosmology, to me, is that, actually, it sits in the overlap between science and philosophy and theology. And, of course, the speakers today are going to cover each of those topics, and... And I will, I will talk about them to different degrees. I'll mainly focus on science because I am a scientist and not a professional philosopher or theologian, but, but I will veer into those other topics. And in fact, the structure of my talk is really in three parts. I'm going to start off as a scientist talking about how our evolving view of the universe uh, from the perspective of physics has actually involved an expansion of our knowledge to sort of ever larger and ever smaller scales. And in, in the process, it's, it's got a, a wonderful unified, we've attained a wonderful unified view of the universe. But the price we pay for that is that human beings seem to have become increasingly insignificant, and there seems to be no place for God. So after the first part of my talk, it's going to be a bit depressed. You might feel a bit depressed. However... <laughs> The second part of the talk, I, I'm going to talk about how recent developments in cosmology in some sense seem to have reversed this trend. And in particular, I'm going to focus on the problem of mind. And I'm going to argue that mind should be regarded as a fundamental rather than an incidental feature of the universe. Now, that's not something all my scientific friends would agree, would, would agree with. And it is, as I say, in the, in, in the domain of philosophy. And incidentally... Um, um, let me say that although I, I did my PhD with, with Stephen Hawking and a great admirer of his science, I don't agree with him on his views of philosophy, so in, I'm siding with Andrew on, on that. Um, and then in the third part of the talk, I'm going to veer into theology, which, again, is not my area of expertise. I, I see the importance of mind as being quite important in the argument because it, mind is the first step on a slippery slope to spirit. And once you accept that mind is fundamental, it seems to me you've got to say spirit's fundamental as well. And so this relates to the whole link, the link between science and religion, which, which I'm also personally interested in. Um, so in some sense, I suppose you could say that, that my talk is, the first part is on the body of the universe, the second part on the mind, and the, the third part on the spirit. Now, I've got lots of slides. I'm not quite sure how far I'll get through things. I'll probably be dropping slides as I go through, but um, I didn't know what other people were going to say. Let me start off with this lovely picture, which, uh, <laughs> which uh, <clears throat> Andrew uh, started with, Einstein and Lemaitre, uh, and he's already explained Lemaitre's key role. I'm very interested in the relation of cosmology and religion, but, and you see immediately there's a sort of paradox. Because if you think about cosmology, the point about cosmology is that everyone in the world basically agrees on the cosmological picture. But the picture we, you favor varies with time. Okay? So it evolves quite rapidly. So the view of cosmology today, I mean, it was only at the beginning of you know, the 20th century, well, 1930, that people had the Big Bang picture, and now we've got much more exotic things. So it's, it's space-independent, but time-dependent. <laughs> On the other view, the, the feature about religion which interests me is that it seems to be space-dependent. Wherever you go in the world, you've got the different religions, Christianity, Islam, um, Judaism, etc. But it tends to be time-independent because religion, you know, religious dogma tends to be frozen. So there's always this sort of fundamental incompatibility which somehow you've got to overcome if you want to amalgamate science and, and religion, in particular cosmology and religion. So anyway, let me start off with the, the first part. And the question really is, I'm talking about cosmos and creation, and the question is, what is the universe? What is the cosmos, if you like? And the point is that what we think 
the universe is has changed radically over history. So, of course, we started off with the geocentric view, in which the Earth is the, the center of the universe, and you've got the planets, but the, the area of the fixed stars, that, that, that is unchanging. So the Greeks drew this great distinction between the changing world on Earth and the sort of eternal, perfect world of the heavens. <laughs> uh, we all know Copernicus demolished that view with his heliocentric view. Um, I like this picture of Copernicus, um, conversation with God. And, and so there is the heliocentric view, which is different, of course, because the sun is in the middle. The other key person who played an important role, of course, was Galileo. Uh, Galileo, of course, was one of the people who didn't invent the telescope, was the first people who could use the telescope and to discover things about the universe, like the fact that there were sunspots and the moons of Jupiter and things like that. And, of course, we, uh, he also studied gravity. He dropped balls from leaning towers and, and discovered one of the... Gravity was really the first force of nature to be discovered. And we all know, of course, he got into trouble with the church. So the sort of the controversy between science and religion, I suppose, will be one of the underlying themes of this part of the talk. Tycho Brahe, um, he's the, 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 the f first person who used telescopes to study very precisely the, the motion of the planets. I mean, of course, the Greeks and the Babylonians did it to some extent as well. But he took the first really obs key observations, precise observations of the planets. Um, he also, incidentally, he uh, was taking a walk one evening in 1572, and he saw the, um, the, the supernova, supernova go off. And that was interesting because he realized it didn't, its position didn't change over the course of the year due to the fact that the Earth went around the sun. And that made him realize that it was something a long, long way away in the heavens. But according to the Greeks, that couldn't happen because the heavens were unchanging. And so nobody believed him. They said it can't possibly be in the heavens because the heavens don't change. So he was very annoyed, and he said, Crasso ingenia o coicus coeli spectoris. I think you'll probably all speak Latin, but that is, oh, thick wits, oh, blind watchers of the sky. Okay, because people will not believe the evidence of their eyes because of their prejudice, which is something we all have to be careful of. Anyway, Kepler um, was his student, and he was the person who, of course, formulated the laws of planetary motion, planets moving on ellipses and, and things like that. And that was crucial to the next step because Isaac Newton, of course, in his Principia, was the basis of all science, essentially, but also in particular had the law of gravitation, which plays a crucial role in, in understanding the structure and evolution of the universe. But it's worth knowing, as I'm, I'm sure... <laughs> Theologians here realize, of course, that Newton himself was also very religious, and he said, blind fate could never produce the wonderful uniformity of the planetary motions. Gravity may put the planets into motion, but without the divine power, it could never have put them into such circulation motions as they have. So, although Newton was a great scientist, he was very much someone who saw a partnership between science and, and, and religion, or, or science and God, if you like. Now, I, a few years ago, I actually visited Turan in Poland, which is the, the place where Copernicus lived for a long time. And I, it was, it's wonderful. You go there, you find these great, the four books, which are the foundations of all of science by um, Bra, Kepler, Galileo, and Newton. Original copies all there in this great cabinet. And it's an amazing feeling that this is the basis of all of our science, is that cabinet with those books. Now, um, even after we knew about that the, the Earth was the... even I mean, Galileo realized that the sun was just one of billions of stars which make the galaxy. So we knew the solar system wasn't all there was in the universe. But people thought that, nevertheless, proper science would always have to be confined to the solar system. And Auguste Comte, the philosopher, never by any means will we be able to study their chemical compositions, the, the stars. The field of positive philosophy lies entirely within the solar system, the study of the universe being inaccessible in any possible science. So he wasn't denying the existence of things beyond the solar system. He just said, that's not proper science. And to some extent, I'm going to be defending science in this part of the talk. 
Yes, uh, Andrew. Well, this, is, this is fascinating. Do you know where this quotation comes from? Yes, I can give you the full reference. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so there's a warning there, uh, because the point was he was wrong because just 10 years later they, they discovered spectroscopy. And that was the basis. Of, and so you have to be careful. Observation of elements are, are hard to anticipate. So when people say science can't study these things, you have to be a little bit careful, because science often ends up being able to study things that you would have first thought they couldn't have done. So I'm, perhaps there are shades of disagreement with Andrew there. We'll see. Um, but anyway, the galactocentric view at the beginning of the 20th century was, was the view which prevailed. Most people thought the galaxy was the universe. And this isn't our galaxy, obviously, but this is um, a, a, a another nearby. This is the Andromeda galaxy. And um, that's what we look like. And we, we just live in our galaxy. We live about sort of eight kiloparsecs away from the middle. So that's the, then the galactic-centric view. Uh, now, people, of course, had speculated that there were things outside our galaxy. Even Kant, who, who Andrew referred to, had, had speculated about that. But it wasn't a popular idea on most physicists. Rutherford who um, I know you will all have heard of, an experimental nuclear physicist, he said in, when he was a professor at Cambridge, don't let me hear anyone use the word universe in my department. Okay, universe was a dirty word in those days, 1908. And there was a famous debate. Um, I think Peter may say more about this in his talk. There was a famous debate uh, in 1921 between Shapley and Curtis about whether there are actually any things outside our galaxy. Shapley was basically uh, said that everything was in the galaxy and all the little bits of light we saw were sort of nebulae within our galaxy. <laughs> Curtis said, no, there is other galaxies which they called island universes. And that was a famous debate in 1921. Um, and then it was resolved rather quickly by Hubble because Hubble was actually able to measure the distance of the Andromeda galaxy and he could by various means using Cepheid stars, and he was able to demonstrate that the Andromeda galaxy is definitely outside our galaxy. And then shortly after that, he was able to dis measure the speeds of all the nearby galaxies, and he found they were all receding. And he, he discovered that by the expansion of the universe, he found that all the galaxies seem to be moving away from us with a speed which is proportional to their distance. So this is the velocity, which is measured by what's called the redshift, and the distance, which is measured by the brightness. And this is the famous Hubble law, which says the velocity at which objects, galaxies, move away is proportional to their distance. And that is the basis of a Big Bang cosmology. Nowadays, that law has been expanded from way up to the edge of the visible universe, essentially. And it's still more or less correct. So it's this nice straight line. <laughs> Hubble's original region, I don't know if I've got a, 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 um, a pointer here, but Hubble's original region was just a tiny little square in that bottom left-hand corner. So, it, But that really is the crucial basis of all cosmology. And there's the Hubble deep field showing galaxies now, because Hubble was only able to look at galaxies within a few million light years, but now we can look up to the edge of the universe, and each of those little dots is a, is a, is a galaxy. And so Hubble's law, I, I, this is the only equation I'm going to show in this talk, is that the velocity is proportional to the distance, and h naught is a constant called the Hubble constant. And if you take the inverse of that, it's a time scale. And that's essentially the age of the universe, because if you imagine that all the <coughs> galaxies are moving away from you, then when you play the picture backwards, every, the, they all get closer. And if you go back far enough in time, they all emerge at a point, and that's the Big Bang. And it was at 13, actually it's now 13.8 year, million, 13 billion years ago. So that's how old the universe is. Now we don't know what happened at t equals zero. But we do know the universe started at, in the compressed state. Well, the remarkable thing is that Einstein's theory of relativity, which had been about 10 years earlier, did predict this. And the idea is, this is the picture people often use. You imagine you've got a balloon, and you, you paint galaxies on the balloon. You inflate the balloon, and all the galaxies seem to get further away. Because in Einstein's theory, space is dynamic. And 
the fact is that it's not that everything is running away from us. It's that everybody sees the same. Space itself is expanding, and you have to think of space in some sense as being the surface of the balloon. And it, in fact, that had been appreciated by Friedman. He was a Russian physicist. Before it was discovered, Friedman realized that Einstein's equations had these properties. And he also realized that the universe might expand forever or it might just uh, recollapse depending on the various parameters. And so there's the picture of the different models. But no one really paid much attention to him. The other person who realized independently that these were the solution of <laughs> Einstein's equations was Lemaitre, who is, uh, you're, you were quite right, whoever said it was Fred Hoyle who, who termed the, used the term, but nevertheless, Lemaitre is, is often called the father of the Big Bang because it was his idea. And I, even that picture, I think, was in Andrew's talk. What people don't often appreciate is that he announced his model of the primeval atom, which is his term for the Big Bang, at a meeting on science and spirituality at the British Association um, meeting in 1932. So although people sometimes think there is this gulf between cosmology and, and, and religion, Actually, uh, it was at a meeting on, on science and religion that the Big Bang picture was announced. Now, how did his contemporaries react? <laughs> Einstein, your maths is correct, but your physics is abominable. Eddington, philosophically, the notion of a beginning of the present order of nature is repugnant to me. Now, it's interesting. You see, Eddington was actually a religious. He was a Quaker. He was very religious but he liked to keep his science and his religion separate. And, and he thought that in some sense it was too theological. You know, if you had a big bang, you realize this was, there's a creation of the universe, it's too dangerous area. Anyway, they were both wrong. So the warning there is great scientists are sometimes wrong. And of course that applies even in the present epoch. So just because Stephen Hawking is a great scientist doesn't mean that everything he says is correct. And, of course, that's even more true of, of lesser scientists. But uh, Then, of course, in 65, they discovered the microwave background, which is the residual radiation from the hot Big Bang. It has a temperature of about 3 degrees, and it has the same, temp has the same temperature everywhere you look. Um, there is a picture of it, uh, this actually taken through the COBE satellite. And, uh, well, actually, sorry, that isn't. That's the WMAP satellite, but anyway, it doesn't. It's a later satellite, but... George Smoot, who was associated with Kobe, uh, he, he said, figuratively no doubt, this was the face of God. And he got into trouble with making that remark, but at least it, it boosted his sales of his book. <laughs> uh, so at this stage, therefore, we have what we might call the cosmocentric view. Now, the, the cosmocentric view, what you've got to realize that, that light travels at a finite speed, and therefore, if I look at something a million light years away, I'm looking at something when it was a million years in the past. And so, actually, that light you see in the microwave background radiation was emitted when the universe was about a million years old. <laughs> so you're looking, you can think of us as sitting in the middle of the universe, in a sense, although everybody can think of themselves as being in the middle. And then you can think of the going back in time are shells, spherical shells. So galaxies form at a certain point, um, and then you're looking back in time, and, and you can think of that microwave background as being essentially a spherical shell. So this is the same color scheme. I, sh I should say that the color refers to the temperature. The temperature is very nearly the same, but it has these tiny fluctuations of about one in a hundred thousand, which are represented by this color. So that's the cosmocentric view. It's not saying we are actually at the center of the universe, but it's saying that anybody can think of themselves as being at the center of the universe. But then something very interesting happened about um, oh, maybe 20 years ago, um, 15 years ago, I guess. They discovered that the universe is accelerating. You see, the, naturally speaking, the universe is expanding, and you would expect that it would decelerate due to gravity. But they found it was accelerating. It, in other words, the galaxies were moving further and further away. And the remarkable thing is that Einstein had predicted that. Einstein had introduced what he called a cosmological constant term in his equations to make the universe static. 
because Einstein didn't believe he thought the universe was the galaxy because his theory was in 1915, well before they just proved that there were extra galactic nebulae. So he introduced this constant to make the universe static. And then when they found that it was expanding, the universe was expanding, Einstein realized he'd made a big mistake and he said this was his biggest blunder because otherwise he could have predicted the, the, the cosmic expansion. But then, remarkably, it turned out that the universe is accelerating and that is probably due to a cosmological constant. So he was right all along. And the evidence of that sort of came from the same sort of Hubble diagram, but you go, you go further into the distance, and at further distances you can measure the distance using supernovae, and you, that's how you get the evidence that the universe is accelerating. I, you won't want to study these diagrams for too long. So what is this cosmological constant? Well, it's essentially vacuum energy. You might think that the vacuum is empty, but actually it's not. The vacuum is very interesting. It has a density. It's, it's full of activity. And this is called dark energy. We think that this vacuum is associated with the cosmological constant. And this is what dominates the density of the universe. Something like 70% of the universe is in the form of, of this dark energy. And also, we think this dark energy was important at very early stages in what's called the inflation picture, which I think maybe Peter will refer to in his talk. So it's really important. And this also changes your view of the future of the universe, because we might have thought the universe was going to re-collapse. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm putting my finger next to the laptop. But uh, you might think the universe is going to re-collapse, but actually that cosmological constant suggests that it's going to actually expand forever. We do, I don't have a pointer, do I? Um, oh, maybe in, unless it's one of... There's a laser on the pointer. Thank you. So I can just do this. Okay, th so there it is. It, it, it's going to expand forever. So it looks as though the universe is going to expand forever. We don't know, though, because cosmologists always change their mind. Um, <laughs> but that was predicted by Le Maitre also. So Le Maitre not only was the first person to understand the origin of the universe, he was the first person to predict the possible future of the universe. He was, he was a, you know, a, great, a great, made enormous contributions to cosmology. Whether he got any of his insights from his religious activities, I don't know. He, he would certainly not say so because he liked to separate them. Um, let me go back to the cosmic background radiation because we now know much more about this. This was the picture from WMAP. This is a picture from a more recent satellite called Planck, which can measure the temperatures more precisely. And cosmologists are really interested in, in the form of those fluctuations, which are the, the color variations. And actually, they're interested in how those fluctuations vary with angular scale. Now, this looks a little bit technical, but the point is that you can, you can compare the temperature at different angular separations. And how those fluctuations vary with angular separation produces a curve which looks like this. So this is called the multipole moment, but basically the bigger L, the smaller the angular separation. And the important point is that the theories predict a very, very precise form for this. The theories of inflation predict a very, very precise form with lots of wiggles. And the remarkable thing is those wiggles have been confirmed by observation. And it's an amazing feeling because if you're a cosmologist, you're working on these things. You know, I started my PhD in, in the 70s. And, you know, you think you, you're not really sure you're just playing a game. It's all mathematics. And you often wondered, I used to wonder as a student, does it really relate to the universe, you know, or am I just doing things in my head? And it was just so amazing when they discovered that this is exactly what we, we, we have been predicted. But that's how science works. You know, you, your theory tends to run ahead of observations, and sometimes it's right. Um, and there's an even more precise um, version. And uh, you all have heard, I think Peter will talk about this, about the bicep results uh, last March, which is supposed to confirm inflation. Well, I don't want to get too much into inflation, but the key point about inflation is that it says that our universe is just one bubble among many bubbles. And so what it suggests is that there could be... This is, the first thing you've got to realize is that we can only see the distance light has traveled since the Big Bang, which is roughly 14 billion light years, okay? But we don't think the universe ends there. That's just as far, how far light can have traveled since the Big Bang. 
So we're just that little pink region, and then we're part of this bubble, which you might call our universe. But if inflation is correct, then there are lots of other bubbles which are drawn. This isn't a photograph, obviously. This is an artist's impression. But, <laughs> but there, are, there are lots of other bubbles as well. So the observable universe could be a minuscule part of a larger physical reality. And you know, a lot of, there's a big debate that goes on in, in, in cosmology about whether this is physics or philosophy, because the point is you can't see these other universes in the simplest picture. But it's not necessarily true. I mean, uh, it has been claimed that there are dark flows where the gravitational effect of things outside a horizon is supposed to be producing unexplained motions. And uh, so the idea of these multiverses, is, is, you might think, is a bit crazy. But George Sathieu, such ideas may sound wacky now, just like the Big Bang Theory did three generations ago. But then we got evidence that it changed the whole way we think about the universe. The history of cosmology is the, is the history of rather wacky ideas becoming confirmed by data. And so you get these sort of... I, I don't know... I guess you don't have it in Edinburgh, but in London we have a free paper called the Metro. Do you have an Edinburgh Metro? Yeah, yeah. And it, it announced... Um, Last June, welcome to the multiverse. Um, is our universe just one bubble of existence and infinite multiverse? The Metro declared we, there is a multiverse. And even the Sunday <laughs> Times reports first hand evidence, first hard evidence, not first hand, <laughs> first hard evidence uh, that other universes exist. But uh, however, I should warn you here don't believe everything you read in the press because you have, those data are always questionable. But anyway, the summary of this, out, this, I call it an outward journey because we're basically looking to larger and larger scales. The summary is what we call the universe is always growing. Okay, that's, that's clear. We've gone from the geocentric to heliocentric to galactocentric to cosmocentric. But humans have become increasingly insignificant. I mean, insignificant as regards scale, certainly both space-time, you know, we're, we're minuscule in terms of size, but even the time for which we exist is minuscule, you know, compared to the, the cosmic time scale. I mean, the human race will doubtless have ceased to exist in the, certainly in another million years, and that's just a, a whist, you know, just a flash in the history of the universe. You know, if, if the history of the universe was 24 hours, mankind uh, arose at one minute to midnight or something like that and probably will disappear about 30 seconds to midnight. Well, I'm being a bit pessimistic. But also, of course, the heavens have been stripped of divinity. You remember we started off with the picture of the Greeks who felt that the heavens were the domain of the divine, and yet the further we've looked, you don't seem to find God, and so now we look to the edge of the universe and there's no sign of God. And in fact, um, you... I think you answered, you mentioned the Russians, how they said the Big Bang wasn't respectable because it was too cler clerical or something. But, but um, you remember when the first, one of the first Russians went into orbit, he announced, I'm in orbit and there's no sign of God. <laughs> well, actually, they, we've looked to the edge of the universe and there's no sign of God. So basically, where's God gone? The heavens seem to have been stripped of their divinity. Now, I've talked about the outward journey of science. But what about the inward journey of science? Because that has been equally uh, interesting. And, and that's also reduced great revelations. I mean, first of all, the, uh, we've had our atomic, the atomic picture and the quantum picture completely have shattered our, our view of, of physical reality. You know, we think these are solid objects, but we know it's atoms. And then even the atoms we now know are just uh, not solid objects, but fuzzy quantum things. But it's also the other great triumph of the in inward journey, looking at the small, has been the unification of all the forces. Now, I'll just do this very quickly, but the point about physics is that it studies the forces that operate in the universe. There's four forces, electricity, well, electricity, the weak, the strong, and gravity. And it's discovered that there is this unification between all the forces. And in some sense, the history of physics is a history of unification. So electricity and magnetism were unified in the electromagnetic force. The weak force, which is involved in radioactive decay, 
physicists used to think that was very different, but now in the seven, 1970s, they realized that it's part, it's merged with the electromagnetic force as part of the electroweak force. And indeed, that picture was confirmed by the discovery of Higgs, you know, the, the God, God particle, a year or so ago. The strong force is supposed to also be merged with the electroweak force as part of what's called the granunified force, or GUT, G-U-T, granunified theory. Not experimentally confirmed, but theoretically quite well understood. And then the great aim is to, is to unify <coughs> gravity with these forces. And, and, and the current favored model is M-theory, which Andrew also referred to. And so the, the great claim is we're on the verge of a theory of everything, as Hawking and Modernoff wrote about. But also, some pretty odd ideas happen with those M-theory, in those M-theories approach. For example, they're extra dimensions. We think of the universe as having three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. But if you believe M-theory, there are lots of they're extra dimensions. It's an old idea that goes back to the 1920s, but actually now we think in N theory there are actually a total of 11 dimensions. And, uh, but you only see the four dimensions, the, the macroscopic dimensions of space and time. The other ones are all wrapped up. And in fact, the uh, picture I quite like is called brain cosmology, in which the physical world you must think of as a four-dimensional brain. That's B-R-A-N-E, okay? Not the one in your head. In this higher dimensional, this five-dimensional bulk, as it's called. But this is all hyper-speculative, but nevertheless, this is what some of the biggest brains, B-R-A-I-N, in the planet work on. <laughs> and, uh, but this is also the sort of picture which the Smolin was criticizing, so you mustn't go away with the impression that everyone believes it. Now, I want to summarize this first part of my talk by, this is my favorite picture. This is the cosmic Euroborus. Do you, have you all seen the cosmic Euroborus? Okay, it's the snake which swallows its own tail. And basically, around the body of the snake, you have all the structures that exist in the universe. So you have people, men and women at the bottom. As you go to the right, you have bigger things, mountains, planets, stars, solar systems, galaxies, the universe. On, if you go to the left, you get smaller things, ants, amoebas, DNA, atoms, nuclei, and things like that. So basically, the body of the snake is a sort of ruler where all the structures that exist in the universe can be um, represented. And let me just briefly go through the history of science again. I, I, I spelt it out to you in 15 minutes or so. I'm going to do it now in just about a minute. So here's the outward journey. Okay, we have the geocentric view, the heliocentric view, the galactocentric view, the cosmocentric view, and then we've got the multiverse. So that's showing how the outward journey has systematically changed our perspective. What about the inner journey? Well, the inner journey is the atom, atom first of all, the atomic picture. And the other thing is that it, it, it was in the, through the inward journey that people discovered the, the forces and, and discovered there were links between the forces that the forces link the micro and the macro world. So the same force which keeps an electron in orbit around a, an atom, a proton, uh, is what preserves a, a solid object. We discovered nuclei uh, the, the, of atoms and the weak and the strong force. And again, there's a link there because the same force which holds the nucleus together in an atom is the force responsible for producing energy through the burning of hydrogen to helium in the, in the sun. Uh, also responsible, I'm afraid, for atomic bombs. Uh, there's the standard model, the electroweak force, which I refer to, and there's the... Uh, Peter, I'm sure we'll talk more about this, but this was the actual uh, uh, atlas that, where they discovered the God particle. And, um, and then we know there's a lot of dark mass. I don't have time to talk about that, but in some sense, those elementary particles we haven't yet discovered, called WIMPs, they're probably related to the dark mass, which is in galaxies. And that's related but also to the grand unified theory. And then finally, we have the M theory as well. So basically, that, to me, it's the, the Ouroboros is a wonderful symbol of the triumph of physics in coming to understand the unity of the, of the universe. 
and, and you put it very nicely, Andrew, in your definition of science, which I wrote down, but I don't have my notes. Basically, you said the purpose of science is to understand the coherence of all the different levels of reality in the structures in the universe, something, something like that. Laws. And so, to me, that's what the Cosmiorobulus does. But there's something wrong. There's something rather depressing here. Because the price we paid... The price we paid for this is, as I said, we become very insignificant. This is the famous Peanuts cartoon. You are of no importance. You're only a tiny speck in an enormous universe. I might as well go back to sleep. I hope you won't do that, because the picture is going to change now. Uh, but Weinberg has this famous quote, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it seems pointless. So it's two-sided. This triumph has come at a price. And... Uh, and there's something missing. I mean, one thing I should say, wh why does the head meet the, the tail? And that happens at the Big Bang. And the reason is this. You remember I said that, of course, as you look to greater distances, you're looking back in time. Well, if you think about it, that means when I look back to 13.8 billion years in the past, the universe was very, very small. So in some sense, the very large becomes the very small. Okay, because you look to the greatest distance you can see and the universe was tiny. That's why the head meets the tail at the Big Bang. So in some sense, the big... I've just only just noticed that for some reason not all of the, the bottom of the slide appears here. Doesn't matter, but uh, anyway. Um, everything should be raised up. Sorry, that sounds a rather religious statement, but I meant it as a... a this, um, I, the slide should be raised, but anyway, not to worry. Um, so the Big Bang, in some sense, is the culmination of the micro-macro connection. And, but here is the, the crown of physics. But I always say there is some missing jewel in the crown of physics. So Andrew asked a question. So who can tell me what the missing jewel is? It begins with M. Well, anyway, it's mind. I mean, you might have said God, but I'm, I'm getting, taking things in easy stages. The missing jewel is mind. You see, to me, it, it makes, it's very pretentious to say we have a theory of everything because it's, only a, a, it's a theory of, of fundamental physics. It doesn't explain half my experience. I mean, half my experience in the world has nothing to do with physics, and I'm a physicist. Half my experience is to do with things that go on in my mind, like my dreams and my memories and my... Um, altered states of consciousness or mystical states of experience. <coughs> so it's a very incomplete picture. So there's something missing here. Um, and there's another irony. You see down at the bottom there are people, the human brain. And the human brain is in some sense the culmination of complexity. Because the, the history of the Big Bang is the history of producing more and more complex structures. And and yet there's a paradox there because the modern view, most scientists are reductionists who take the view that consciousness is just an excretion of your, your brain. So mind is in some sense plays a purely passive role in the universe. The universe is like a machine which carries on like a clockwork machine. We just are passive observers. We think we've got free will, but it's all an illusion. We're really zombies and all this. And of course, from this perspective, Religion and spirituality and mystical insights are just illusions. That's the mainstream view, but of course not all scientists take that view. But it's probably the majority view. Um, and in fact, the view that consciousness is unimportant has been voiced by many people. Here are some interesting <laughs> quotes. John Watson, who actually was the behaviorist psychology founder of that, this the time seems to have come when psychology must discard all reference to consciousness, when it need no longer delude itself into thinking that it is making mental states the objects of obs observation. This is a psychologist. Here's a philosopher, Dennett. Consciousness appears to be the last bastion of occult properties, epiphenomena, and immeasurable subjective states. In short, the one area of mind best left to philosophers who are welcome to it. Let them make fools of themselves trying to corral the quicksilver of phenomenology into a respectable theory. So you see psychologists and philosophers basically saying, forget consciousness, it's, it's not relevant. 
However, there's an opposite view, and this mainly comes from physicists who are interested in quantum theory. Wigner, it's not possible to formulate the laws of physics in a fully consistent way without reference to the consciousness of the observer. John Wheeler, mind and universe are complementary. Bernard Despagnier, the doctrine that the world is made up of objects whose existence is independent of human consciousness turns out to be in conflict with quantum mechanics and with facts established by experiments. Chomsky, who of course was a linguist, physics must expand to explain mental experiences. And Penrose, we need a revolution in physics on the scale of quantum theory and relativity before we can understand mind. So there are physicists, probably a minority of physicists, but some influential physicists who think consciousness is important. And I and I'm certainly share that view. Well, why do we think mind is important? Now, some of the ideas are just really, you'll be familiar with these, but they're just the sort of fairly standard arguments. First of all, the fact that the universe is comprehensible at all. Here's a quote from Jeans. The universe is more like a great thought than a great machine. De Broglie, the structure of the material universe is something in common with the laws that govern the workings of the human mind. The beauty of the universe, beauty in equations is more important than fitting experiments. That was Paul Dirac, one of the greatest physicists of the last century. Wheeler again, one day a door will surely open and expose the glittering <coughs> central mechanism of the world in all its beauty and simplicity. And not only that, the Euroborus itself, you see, which I put so much emphasis on as, a, as, a, as an image of what science has taught us, if you think about the Euroborus, it's really a sort of the history of the blossoming of our consciousness. Because you remember I said that basically the history of science is expanding your consciousness to ever bigger and smaller scales. So if you start off with uh, a sort of uh, relatively uh, young people, I mean young people meaning 12th century people, that they could just observe things on the scale from sort of you know, ants to mountains or whatever, but then they had telescopes and, and microscopes and the 16th century they could look further and so on. And today we have essentially looked, expanded our consciousness all the way out to the maximum scale. Uh, on the minimum scale, we can't get too small experimentally, but we can certainly speculate about things. So in some sense, the history of physics is a history of expanding consciousness. And, uh, and also, in a certain sense, what physics gives us really is a series of paradigms which is, which is just a, mental, a model of the universe. And as our knowledge of the world has increased, our common sense notions of reality are being progressively demolished. And I'm sure you're all aware of this. Atomic theory demolishes the idea that objects are solid. Special relativity demolishes our common sense ideas of space and time. General relativity says space-time is curved. Quantum theory says reality is fuzzy. So it isn't solid objects at all, but everything is described by wave functions, which collapse when you look at them. Kaluza Klein says they're higher dimensions. Quantum gravity, which is what the ultimate aim of physics, says you go beyond space and time altogether. So really, physical paradigms essentially provide a sequence of mental models. And if you like, intellectual, ultimate reality, whatever it is, even from physical reality, can only really be understood intellectually. So then it becomes, it really becomes, I mean, that is the price of the unification. And yet it seems really odd that so many physicists say mind is irrelevant, when actually the whole picture we have of the universe is essentially mind-like. And so you've got this sort of picture which, you know, you have... You start off with mathematics, which gives physics, which gives the universe through the Big Bang, and then life arises, which generates minds, and then the minds generate the mathematics. So you've got this amazing... Penrose always stresses this. You know, you've got this circular... So to me, uh, also, mind really does seem to play a crucial role. And so, and so the question is... Well, the question is, is mind fundamental or incidental to the universe? I take the view that it's fundamental. Now... The arguments I've given you so far are sort of soft arguments. You know, they're just sort of 
intuitive arguments, which don't carry much scientific weight, but there are arguments which have more substance to them as to why mind is important. Uh, one is to do with um, quantum theory, uh, because that many of the physicists, as I explained, took the view that quantum theory in some sense involves consciousness. One is to do with the flow of time. I wasn't going to put this in, but Andrew mentioned it, so I wanted to stress that. And uh, the other is to do with the anthropic principle and the fine tunings. Now, I need, um, I need uh, the guidance of my uh, chairman. Uh, wh how long do I go on for? Because I know we started late, but also I know we've got... Uh, we've got lunch, at, and I haven't even got... Yeah, but then we started, we started about 10 minutes late anyway, so how, when do you want me to actually stop? Okay. But that's gonna, that will eat into the, the question session. No, we've got five minutes left. Okay. Now, so the question is, I'm, not gonna be, have, I'm going to skip some of these slides, else I'm not going to get on to the last part of my talk. Um, so I'm going to show some of these pictures of quantum theory. Close your eyes, and the camera will edit them both, because I'm just cutting out the bit on quantum theory, because otherwise I'll just uh, not have time to get through all of my talk. So this was I, I, the way these things, I have to talk, I have to show the slides. All, the, the point about this, these slides is simply that quantum mechanics is, is the one point in physics where consciousness perhaps comes in. Not all physicists accept that, but it's one possible interpretation. And I, I just told this, I like this Woody Allen joke. A guy goes to a psychiatrist and says, Doc, my brother's crazy, he thinks he's a chicken. The doctor says, well, why don't you turn him in? The guy says, I would, but I need the eggs. <laughs> and quantum mechanics is just like that. Quantum theory is crazy, but it, it seems to work. We really need the eggs. And so, you know, you get all this, I'm sure you've heard all about the Schrodinger's cat and, and the paradoxes. But uh, maybe, uh, maybe one of the later speakers will, will talk about that in greater detail. The mystery of time. Well, again, I don't really have time to focus on this in too much detail, but... <laughs> but you know, it really is crucial because physics plays such a crucial role in time, and yet we just don't understand it. The famous quote from St. Augustine, what is time, no one asked, I know. If I wish to explain it to one that asketh, I know not. Albert Einstein, who did more than anyone to elucidate the nature of time, time is nothing but a stubborn, persistent illusion. Feynman, one of the greatest physicists of the last century, we physicists work with time every day, but don't ask me what it is, it's too difficult. <laughs> And uh, three recent books on time, which um, I can recommend. The book by Sean Carroll, The End of Time by Julian Barber, Time Reborn by Lee Smolin, a follow-up to the book Andrew mentioned. Good books, but I'll tell you something really weird. None of them mention consciousness. They barely mention consciousness. And yet, to me, the fundamental problem of time is the problem of consciousness. Now, I don't have time to talk about the problems, but there are basically two problems of consciousness which are not accommodated by physics. The first is the problem of flow of time, and the second is the problem of what I call the specious present. Now, there will be people in this room who are much more expert on these topics than me, and maybe they will develop this later on. But the point about the flow of time is that in Einstein's theory, you have space and time, uh, and we have world lines. And in some sense, you have your, we have the intuitive idea that our consciousness is like a bead going up the world line of the brain. That's what the passage of time is. But that makes no sense in relativity theory. We have the impression that we have a decision. I have a decision whether to stop talking. I can make a decision whether to stop talking in five minutes or what to, whether I should carry on talking so you miss lunch. Now, I think I have, because I don't have free will because the chairman is going to override me, <laughs> but, but he ha thinks he has free will, but not according to relativity. According to the relativity, the, it's a block universe. There is no flow of time. Something is missing, and that's what I'm interested in. The concept of the specious present is more complicated. We only experience the universe in, in sort of minimal blocks of time. For, the for human, it's about a, something like a tenth of a second. It's the shortest time you can have. But who's to say consciousness should not exist with a different form of species present? 
you know, mountain of talking to each other on a time scale of millions of years, we would never know. I'm not arguing that mountains are conscious, obviously. But so I'm getting into more theological issues. It always seems to me there is the human species present. We experience the universe with this minute. Our experience is basically confined between something like a, a second and a hundred years. Who's to say there isn't a form of consciousness in the universe which operates on a longer time species present, a sort of a terrestrial, galactic, or even a, a cosmic species present? And of course, that's obviously linking up to um, theological ideas too. And I don't know, uh, most scientists and physicists won't take this too seriously, but maybe theologians are more open to this sort of speculation. And so it always seems to me that the marriage, that the ultimate aim is that we will, we've got our two theories of physics, quantum theory and relativity theory, which describe the small and the large, and yet they're incompatible. And so the final theory of physics has got in some way to reconcile these theories. And I don't think M theory alone is that final theory. It has to be deeper. And the question is, will this final theory accommodate mind? And I like to think it does. Uh, and I think, it, I think time and higher dimensions will play a role in that. But I want to then just get on to the question of the, the anthropic principle. I'm going to do this very, very quickly. Um, and this is to do, this is the last piece of evidence, if you like, that there's something funny about the universe. And the, you have to distinguish between the anthropocentric view, which says that man is central to the universe, and then there's the mechanistic view, which came out of Newton's theory, which says the universe is basically a machine, and, uh, and mind and man and women are irrelevant. Uh, sorry, when I say man, I mean man with a capital M, okay? Um, and then the, the anthropic view is a sort of reaction against that, which says that certain features of the universe can only be explained in some sense because they're required for life to exist. It's saying there's a sort of selection effect that the universe has to look the way it is because otherwise it wouldn't be here. Um, now, I don't quite... I hate the word anthropic because it, anthropos is the Greek word for man, and this is not really to do with man at all, or women. It's to do with the evolution of complexity. But nevertheless, there is this puzzling feature that the Big Bang seems to be to increasing order and complexity, which in some sense culminates in mind. And uh, I'll just give you one example of this to give you a flavor of it. I told you about the four forces, the strong, the electric, the weak, and the gravitational force. They have a sort of uh, strength, which is described by a coupling constant, which is a dimensionless number, which is 10 to the minus 40 for gravity, 10 to the minus 10 for weak, 10 to the minus 2 for electric, 10 for the strong force. But nobody knows why those coupling constants have the val values they do. I mean, I don't know what Peter will say about this, but uh, the theories of physics do not tell us what those values are. And the question has always been, will the final theory of physics explain them? Well, the answer is they don't at the moment, but there are certain puzzling connections between those constants which aren't explained. For example, I can't go into the details, but it turns out the only reason you can have planets is because alpha g is the 20th power of alpha e. This is because you need certain types of stars. Now, that's true because the 20th power of 10 to the minus 2 is 10 to the minus 40, but, and that's required, but no one can explain it. Um, that was a star-forming region, incidentally. Now, the supernovae, when a star finishes its nuclear burning, it may explode, and then the elements it's generated through nuclear burning eventually <coughs> go into outer space and get incorporated in our bodies. But the only reason a supernova goes off is because there is a balance between alpha G and alpha W. Again, the detail, details are too technical, but basically, when the star collapses, it generates a surge of neutrinos, and those neutrinos blow off the envelope through weak interactions. If the weak interaction was too weak, they'd go straight through. If it was too strong, those neutrinos would never reach the surface. So there's a picture of a, a supernova remnant. So the point is that these relationships are required for life, but they're not explained. Now, there's a whole lot of, of relationships like that. I've just mentioned those two. 
Now, close your eyes because I'm going to skip through some more of these things now. Um, there are different, quite a lot of different reactions to the, the anthropic principle. It's a very emotive topic within physics. I do not feel like an alien in the universe. The more I examine the universe and examine the details of its architecture, the more evidence I find that the universe, in some sense, must have known we were coming. That's Freeman Dyson, very positive. On the other hand, here is Heinz Pagels. The influence of the anthropic principle on contemporary cosmological models has been sterile. It has explained nothing and it has even had a negative influence. I would opt for rejecting the anthropic principle as needless clutter in the conceptual repertoire of science. Strongly anti. And I wrote my first paper on this with Martin Rees way back in 79. And some physicists were furious. You know, I remember having an argument with some physicists who said he thought it was obscene. The idea was obscene because they want to explain everything without any mystical fine-tuning. Brandon Carter, who actually introduced the word anthropic, he says the anthropic principle is a middle ground between the primitive anthropocentrism <laughs> of the pre-Copernican age and the equally unjustifiable antithesis that no place or time in the universe can be privileged in any way. And that is probably the majority view now. Nowadays, the anthropic principle is, is almost um, mainstream. Okay? There's still people feel strongly about it, but far more physicists now, influential physicists, accept it. Now, as I said, to me, what I interpret the anthropic principle as a complexity principle. Because what happens in the history of the universe is that you, as you go from the Big Bang, and I think we'll hear more about the history of the universe from Peter, is that you, you develop more and more complicated structures from quarks and nucleons, the atoms, molecules, then you form galaxies and stars, biomolecules, cells and organisms. And really, the fine tunings I've referred to, they are a necessary condition in order that to build up complexity. And in some sense, you see consciousness, brains and consciousness are just in some sense the culmination of that process of complexity, and indeed mind and spirit. So that's, I, I tend to see that the development of complexity is crucial. But now let's, um, I want to end up Yep, so I'm going to end up with um, the interpretation of the fine tunings. Can I? Yes. Because we did start late, you see. We st <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, what are the interpretations of the fine tuning? Because the fine tunings play a crucial role. Now, obviously, one interpretation is that God created the universe. So, you can imagine that this is the a space with all the values of the comp coupling constants, and, and God chooses the values which make life arise. Obviously, most physicists don't like that. But here's another view. Um, this came from Wheeler. The idea was that the universe can develop consciousness, but you require consciousness to collapse the wave function. So the idea is that here's the Big Bang. It develops consciousness, which, which then reflects back on its own origin, rather like we've done today. And it sort of, sort of brings the universe into existence. Most cosmologists find that rather too mystical, um, or rather too philosophical. But the third view, which is the one which most physicists prefer, is that there's a multiverse. Now, I've told you about the arguments for the multiverse. Um, but the idea is that there are lots and lots of universes, and, and we just happen to be in the universe, one of the universes which has the right conditions for life. And, and many physicists like that because it basically does away with the need for God, in their view. Um, and actually, it, it's quite interesting because we're, today we're interested in the, in the relationship between physics, philosophy, and theology. And in some sense, there's, uh, the multiverse, if you like, is physics. The consciousness creating a universe is philosophy, and, 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 and God is in the domain of theology. Now... I, I'm, I must say, I'm fascinated in the relationship between um, these different areas. Physicists tend to, by and large, be rather dismissive of philosophy. Andrew pointed this out, and, and I disagree with that. I, I think it's, uh, uh, but there's also um, the, 
the barrier, the boundary between philosophy and theology. And actually, what Andrew didn't mention is that physicists tend to be even more dismissive of theology than they do of philosophy. So there's a sort of gradation of, of, of explanations. But actually, all of these explanations are equally logically coherent. It's just a question of what your bias is. Now, I have got to end. So let me just, can you close your eyes? Because I've, I've, this is my book on the universe or multiverse, which I, I guess I've got to give it a plug. I think the hard copy is out of print now, but basically it's arguing that the development, the best way, in other words, it's arguing, it does present all sides of the story because it gives the anti as well as the pro, but it, the basic idea is that the variations of the constants can be explained in the multiverse scenario. Now let me finally finish. I mean, the basic idea, you see, <laughs> is that if you've got, physicists want to have a model for the Big Bang, but if you've got a model for one Big Bang, you're bound to have a model for, um, it's bound to produce other big bangs, and that's the basic argument. Now, kindly close your eyes. I'm just going to the end of my talk. Um, um, the final question is, just to finish, <laughs> okay, I want to just say something about the multiverse and, and religion, because I, I haven't really got onto the theological issues, which I did promise. First of all, the idea of the multiverse actually arises in religion well before it arose in, in, in physics. So I've got some quotes here, not from Christian theology, but actually from, um, from well, um, Islamic philosophy. There are innumerable universes besides this one. Although they are limitedly large, they move out like atoms in you, therefore you are called uh, unlimited. And then indeed, in Fakir al-Din al-Razi, he talks about other universes in, in, in one of these, these texts. I, I'm not going to read it because we've run out of time. But I just want... But the final question is, of course, is there room for God? And I'm sorry, I apologize to the chairman and, and to God that I've actually um, pushed him into negative time. But anyway, I'll just briefly... That's the, what the, the final question I want to end up on because I know that's what will be taken further. Is there room for God? And uh, I had some slides here which I'm not going to actually go through, but the point is this, that there is, of course, this long debate about whether you need God to create the universe. And, and historically, one has always... The tendency has always been to say, well... Ultimately, if there's a big bang, physics can take you further and further and further back towards the big bang. But ultimately, it doesn't ask the question, who lit the fuse? And so there's always been this argument that actually you need God to start the universe. The physicists have always fought back and said, well, no, it's not true, because the further we learn, the more we learn about the physics, the more we push God out of the picture, just as the more we look into outer space, the more we seem to exclude God. The more we seem to get pro towards the Big Bang, the more we seem to make God unnecessary. And in particular, when the multiverse idea came out, there was a big debate about whether you need God or multiverse, which to me was completely... Sorry, close your eyes. Um, that was the question that really interested me. Do you have God or multiverse? And as I mentioned, some physicists favor the multiverse because it avoids the creator. On the other hand, other people like Davis say both ideas are equally metaphysical the, because you can't see the universe is either, the other universe is either. Um, what I do think is true is that if you believe uh, there's only one universe, the argument for a creator is stronger because then there is something really puzzling to explain. Uh, there's a quote here from Neil Manson, the mu multiverse is the last resort of the desperate atheist. It's not his view, I should say. <laughs> he complained about this to me. But it's a view he quoted. But it's a wonderful phrase. The multiverse is the last resort of the, the desperate atheist. But I think it's clear that the simple dichotomy between God or multiverse is, is completely simplistic. Because if God can create one universe, he can also create a, a, the multiverse. And... The history of physics, to me, there are these taboo words, ACG, um, anthropic consciousness and God. To me, the history of science is one in which science progressively desensitizes itself to these taboos. Anthropic used to be a taboo word 20 years ago. Now people 
are happy to talk about it. Consciousness was a taboo word 10 years ago. Now people are beginning to talk about it. The current word, which is taboo, I'm afraid, among most um, physicists is God. But who's to know what's going to happen in another 10 years? So with that positive thought and apologies for overstepping the time, thank you. <laughs>